Hi, Don Famular here again, and I am so excited as I continue with this series, the artist series at a distance, we get to reach into the lives of these musicians that have such interesting paths, are great, great artists. And today I wanna to welcome Kaki King. Thank you so much for joining me. Hello, lovely to be here. Kaki, with these artists that I interview, what's fun about it is I wanna first find out, you know, you have such an interesting career and in how you have pushed yourself and how you persevere through incredible ideas and opportunities that you've had. Where did this start for you? How did, you know, guitar and composition <laughs> get involved in your life? I lucked out. I started playing when I was really young and uh, I was about four, five years old. And just, you know, my parents thought, well, she should be enriched with music. And so they had me take these little guitar lessons. But I think, you know, now that I have kids of my own, I can see, you know, it was, I had, I did have a little knack for it. I grew up with the guitar. I always knew how to play it. I was never super serious about it. I never studied anything difficult beyond you know, blues licks and basic chords and stuff until I became a teenager. And then I realized that I was not going to, I was already as good as everyone else was who was, who had been playing for a year. So I was not going to get any better unless I kind of found a path, but I'd always been really, really interested in composing and in writing just, just, you know, I liked writers. I liked, um, I liked authors. I liked, you know, film script writers. I just thought that writing and composing was this like very, like the ultimate high art so I took my hand at, at writing some tunes and I, you know, wrote songs that I sang and then I wrote songs that I didn't sing. And along the way, the guitar playing, I needed more tools inside of my playing to help me compose the way what I, what I heard um, in my head. And so that's when the technique got a little different and where tune, different tunings took off. Um, but really, you know, the, the Genesis was from a very, very young age and the the, the, you know, the beauty of that is I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. And I was fearless because there, I had no idea how, you know, I had nowhere to go. <laughs> so were there any composers or compositions or groups that inspired you at that time to get you involved in composition? I mean, it was more just any, 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 just songs, you know, it was just songs. The fact that, that songs existed and they were being written by people and it, whether it was, whether it was Bob Dylan or Bjork or Stravinsky, it just, I was like, wow, this didn't exist before this human. And I always would get really interested in, you know, um, the, 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 or, the origin story of a song, maybe a famous song that had been covered many times, made classic by a true artist. But I was always like, wait, who, who, who wrote this? That was always a fascinating thing to me. You know, it wasn't anyone in, in particular. I just, I just wanted to do that. Was there a guitar, you know, guiding force that kind of pulled you more into understanding more about guitar? So there was a record label in the early 80s. I think it may have been started in the late 70s. It was called Wyndham Hill. And mm -hmm. it was founded by Will Ackerman. And my father, I mean, so my father is my, it, you know, he's, the, he's also this huge source, really. <laughs> I would be nowhere without this guy. And of course, you know, he was not at all any kind of stage dad. He didn't pressure me at all, but he just got me. He just met me where I was and just was like, hey, you want to listen to this album? I don't know. You might think it's cool. So he would listen to these Wyndham Hill records. I mean, at, you know, at the time of their release, so when I was a very, very small kid. And then I kind of got into this, um, you know, so players like Michael Hedges, he's the big, very famous um, player who we all know and love. Um, Alex DeGrazzi, Will Ackerman himself, um, Andrew York, you know, there are these records that were just brilliant being released on this little label. And unfortunately, it was under the aegis of, of the new age world, which had its own kind of branding problems, let's say. Um, <laughs> that didn't really turn me on, for instance, you know, when I got back into those records in the early 90s, um, when I was listening to that style myself. But they really had a, an approach to the guitar that I hadn't really heard um, myself prior to that, you know, that group of people. Wyndham Hills had such a has such a wonderful wide variety of music on it, and they really had high quality music and great artists that were on it. Absolutely, so interesting to be influenced by that at, at, at such a young age. So now you, you got involved, you know. So you graduated Westminster Schools in Atlanta. Yep. And then the, did you go to New York after that point? I did. I went to I went to New York. I went to NYU without any idea of what really needed to, what my path was. I honestly, I assumed I'd be a lawyer. My parents are lawyers. My sister is now a lawyer. I just, that was the family business. So I really, really in my heart thought, 
I'll get to see New York. I'll get to live on my own. And then I'll go and work for mom and dad and, you know, push paper around for the next 40 years. I, I really, I just assumed that was my birthright. Well, the path <laughs> has changed, just so you know, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so what is, what is this, this finger style technique? You know, you, you, was there something that you started to step further into the guitar to understand more styles or techniques? Again, I have to always frame it around, around composing. So in the meantime, I'm also a drummer. And the way I became a drummer was in fourth grade. Uh, they started the band and the orchestra at school. And my parents said, well, can she, you know, she plays guitar. Is there a place she can play guitar? And there was no place for a guitarist in either of those things. But they said, well, you know, guitar is basically a rhythm instrument, so she might as well play drums. So <laughs> from age nine, I had, I have actually a lot more musical training in, in percussion than I do in any other musical instrument. So from age nine, through, all throughout high school, I played in concert band and I played percussion. Um, so that's where all of the, any kind of musical theory, any kind of um, rudiments, any kind of discipline I have comes from drumming, as well as the sort of, you know, the coordination that, you know, this can will do one thing and this hand will do another, and I'm joining them together. And it's, you know, sounds more complicated than it is. And I use that a lot in my guitar playing. Mm -hmm. So it was this, the Wyndham Hill solo guitar, un, the unwritten rule was that you do it alone, that you do it by itself, that the guitar contains every thing that you need and that it's your, you know, the goal is to tease it out, you know, item by item and sound by sound. And so that you have essentially what amounts to this, you know, the sound of almost like a full band on one instrument. And I think for a lot of people who are not, you know, familiar, I mean, thank God the, 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 the genre is getting so much more popular and familiar these days. It's beautiful. Um, but, you know, at the time people would say, wow, that sounds like, you know, three people playing three different things. I, I can't be one person. Um, and, you know, I think you kind of, as a, as a young person, you get a real kick out of that. I was always trying to, to extract new sounds for the purpose of integrating them into a right, uh, into something that I wrote. And I had done that from a pretty early age. And of course I played drums and guitar and bass and bands with people. And you know, I don't all, all sort of other, all this other stuff, but this guitar playing and writing was just this personal goal of mine that I, that I had. And I, and I kept kind of to myself, even, even during college. Um, it wasn't until after that, well, it wasn't until 9-11 that, that it became this, this primary thing that I did in public. So yeah, it, it was, a, it was just this, I don't know. It was like, a, like, like, like almost like practicing a martial art on your own. Um, there was a lot of discipline, a lot of practice, a lot of dedication, and the reward was yet to be known. <laughs> well, there is much discipline in what we do as musicians, and it really takes that level of perseverance and that level of focus. Yeah. With it. How important was the school music program for you when you were in school? I was brought into the high school band when I was in junior high. And I was, it was, um, my band director was named Joe Botter and he needed more percussionists that had talent. And he, you know, he saw that I had this, this promise and this dedication and the discipline. And so he, he put me in high school band when I was still in eighth grade and it really made me go, okay, you know, I can go somewhere with this. If I take it just, if I just take an inch of it seriously, because you know what it's, I mean, I don't know if you played concert band, but you're in the back, you're twirling your sticks, you're waiting for the one symbol crash. You get away with murder. It's not, we're not the most, you know, together focused group. So I, you know, so, but I tried in my own way to go, okay, I'm going to learn how to do it. <laughs> five stroke roll. I'm going to learn how to play these rudiments, how to properly tune a timpani, you know, just, just all of this stuff. And I, and I was able to take some, um, some AP music classes and apply, you know, music theory to the instruments that I was on. And so that it was profoundly important for my musical education to have that background. That was my ear training. That was my rhythmic training. That was my, you know, do it 30 times rest. And then the next, 15 times you got it and it's done, you know, like the muscle memory, all of these concepts that I had no, because no one was telling me to play guitar on time in tune, you know, in key, but I was, I had to show up as a drummer. You know, it's kind of interesting when you speak about playing drums and the importance of drumming. I just interviewed Tommy Emmanuel, who's a phenomenal guitar player, Amazing. who's also a great drummer. Yeah. And I had the chance of interviewing the great late Chick Corea, who was also an excellent drum set player. So I, I, I really admire that. So I got to ask you, were there any drummers 
that you listened to or that inspired you from drums per se? Um, you know, I, <laughs> I am not a great drummer. I really, really want to be. Okay. You know who inspired me the most? So what's, what's the drummer from Coldplay? What's his name? Oh, um, you don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody knows what that guy's name. No one even knows what that guy looks like. That guy's a millionaire and he gets to play drums. And that's, that's what I wanted to be. I just wanted to play like rock and roll drums and not make it too complicated and like make money and have no one have any idea who I was. That really, that was this, like, I was a beautiful dream. So no, I never got, I mean, I played, I played drum set. I never got beyond just being a solid rock player, but it, it was, uh, yeah, it was just this sort of goal of just like, like holding it down. You know, I didn't need to be fancy. I just wanted to, I just wanted to be totally in pocket, hold down the beat, be cool as hell. <laughs> and be able to do it for like four hours a night. So that that was my um. But yeah, but I really I I. So we should find out what that guy's name is. It's probably I, we, Joe we Joe Smith, <laughs> and could have been me. We'll we'll find out for sure. So what I get a kick out of it is that this perseverance that you had, you started busking in New York in the New York City subway area. Yeah. So now you had the courage to say, I want to play music. And you just went and you had to get your license to do it. And you, you did it. No, I didn't get a license. <laughs> um, although, <laughs> so this is actually, this is where it all gets interesting. So I had, you know, I'm like, I'm going to go be a lawyer. I play guitar in this weird style that no one has, has really been popular in for 20 years at the time. And I am about to get my college degree and think about grad school or the next step or just I wanted to I think I just wanted to live in New York and, you know, work in a diner and just, you know, have a have a life of my own for five minutes. So 9-11 um, happened and that was a very big turning point because I really was fresh out of college right at that moment. That, that summer semester was my last semester it was weeks in and I couldn't get a job. I, I couldn't access my friends. I couldn't move around the city. You know, it was traumatic. I ultimately had sort of set myself up for weeks and weeks saying, I need to connect with people. I need to connect with my instrument. I need to, I need to heal. I need to do something. And I finally took my little portable amp and I finally went and went to the subway platform and started playing. And that was scary because it wasn't just the unknown. It was just the unknown of everything. And I remember one time I was playing and people were listening and then three trains went through the station and didn't stop. And it was apocalyptic. It was terrifying. We did not know what was coming next. You know, it was a few weeks after 9-11. So it was, a, it was maybe, maybe more like a few months, but it, it was a difficult time for the city. I was also, I had no money. I had no way of earning an income as I was, you know, set out to do. So I was able to make some money and, and connect with people. And because so many people asked if I had a CD. And I remember at that time, CDs were these discs that they spin around. Anyway, they were, they were the, you know, people bought them and they bought them off you on the subway. So, um, so I made my first record for the sole purpose of selling it on subway platforms and making some cash. And that record made its way to where it is today. It's kind of interesting. First of all, Will Champion is the drummer from Coldplay. <laughs> That's a made up name. That's not a person. That's how I just remember Will that. Champion. No, I don't believe you. Will <laughs> Champion, you check it out no. for sure. So, that's, so here he is inspiring you, and now we have an understanding. Probably of had a weird name like Aloysius Huxtable, and they're like, no, 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 just, we'll just need to simplify this. The band's name is Coldplay. You're a Will <laughs> Champion. <laughs> All right. Thanks for the, you know, the fact where did, check. Where did this, where did this, listen, you, you've got some guts and you've got some real passion that's driving you. Where do you think that comes from? Where, where, what, 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 what drives you? Just being utterly clueless. <laughs> <laughs> and, and frankly, you know, I have, okay. At this point, I have beaten every single odd in that I have made a very tasty little career for myself that now supports two children and a mortgage out of playing solo guitar. Like that's, that's very, very, very unlikely. 
It is not the most popular genre, even if you do it really well. It is not the most known. It's not really a place where there's infinite growth, you know, and, and the fact that I keep getting to do it year after year is a miracle. So I think that I just, and I have had endless amounts of humiliation in that time period. I have played to three people in a bar in Milwaukee. I have played to you know, no one on a subway platform. <laughs> but I've also played to thousands of people at festivals and I've also opened for rock stars and been in movies. Like I just, I've done it all. And I, and so I think that I just don't have any, you can't hurt me. That's for sure. And I've taken, I, I'm totally, I have seen the reward that risk has brought me. So I'm, I welcome risk. So maybe that's where I get my, <laughs> my fearlessness. <laughs> I don't know. That's a very deep philosophy. I mean, I've also embarrassed this. myself on stage a lot. I mean, <laughs> really, the stuff that has come out of my mouth and the strings I've broken, the, the things that have gone wrong on stage. Like, I'm really, I've just been, I've been okay with it after a while. But that's <laughs> after 20 plus years worth of gigs. And that, that, that comes with time. That sure comes with time. But that also comes with a certain amount of courage that you seem to have because you are, again, not afraid to take that risk. And that's really a very, very powerful message for people that are watching this to understand that it takes a real belief in yourself and then it takes you having to take that step where you might not know where you're going, but you're taking that step anyway. I think what you just said is really key. I think just the, the propulsion, the forward momentum, the letting go, getting out of your own way, it, it is really hard. Even for people who've done a long time to get out of the self-critical thinking um, but I think what's really important is just to keep going. What's the next step? What's the tiniest next step that needs to be done? Do it, get it out of the way, keep going. Whether that's writing, recording, or practicing, um, because that's the only way you stop the, your head from going, this is not good, this is not what I want, I, this, you know, this was supposed to be different, or it was supposed to be earlier, or this is not my, you know, the timeline isn't correct. You know, there's a lot of things that we can do to, to really undermine ourselves. Unfortunately, in the music industry, and I'm sure people throughout the course of life, they have thoughts of failure and they sometimes word themselves to failure. So it seems like you really are a positive, upbeat person and you face challenges. And when the challenge comes to you, you just deal with it. Here's the interesting thing. I was not a positive, upbeat person when I wrote my first album. I wasn't a positive, upbeat person for the first five albums. I have become a person that really rolls with the punches and thinks this is all pretty amazing and hilarious and feels a huge amount of gratitude. But my music is still not upbeat. There is a darkness that I am able to tap into without having to carry it all the time. And I think that was a really, really important thing for me to grow out of. I really embraced anxiety, depression, self-hatred. I, I was very full of all of that stuff and it hurt myself and it hurt people around me and it isolated me. And I was, you know, I was not the world's most, you know, happy person. And at some point it just wasn't serving me anymore. And my fear was that if I make a change and if I really let go of a lot of stupid stuff, how am I ever going to write music again? Well, guess what? The darkness does not go away. It's with you when, you know, it's just, it's there, you tap into it. And I heard, I've heard a lot of composers talk about how, you know, you, you can, I mean, it's, it's like, right. It's, it's like everything is a soundtrack. You know, you, you can write a, you can feel a thing in life. You can feel an emotion very deeply and it can touch you very profoundly without having to carry it all day long and all year long. I think that was a good lesson. I, I was able to readjust my, my, my life and my expectations and what I wanted. And, and this is around the time that, get, that gay marriage became legal. And I suddenly was like, wow, I could, I could have a family. I could have happy, you know, I could have this happiness that I thought was not available to me, which is not true, but it, uh, that was a story I told myself in my head. You know, it was sort of this profound cultural shift as well and a personal shift for me. And so that, that was what was interesting is that that ability to sort of tap into some dark emotive stuff is still very much there. I just don't live with it all the time. It comes out in music, but not in me. But that's, that's great that you're able to, to you know, put it in its place 
yeah. and deal with life and compose. But, you know, through who you are as a person, it's coming out in your music. So how did Valor Records in 2002, you signed on with them. How did that come about? Okay, this is the Hollywood version. And don't ever fall. This, this, this is the truth. This is not <laughs> what anyone should count on doing. I'm playing music in the subway. I have a CD. I sell it to some people. The CD makes its way, and I had my contact info on it. It makes its way to a club called the Knitting Factory. Like it grew little legs and walked. Apparently, <laughs> I, I the Knitting Factory calls me and says, "Do you want to come and play a residency?" Meaning, I played every Saturday night for tips and dr and drinks and whatever. Oh, that's not true. They actually paid me as well, like a hundred bucks. So here I am, have, I have a paid gig in New York City that ran for two months. This guy walks down to get a beer at the lower venue in this club where I'm playing and he sees me play and he gives me his info. And he's like, I've got a label and I manage artists. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And then he manages me for the next 12 years. But that <laughs> is not, <laughs> that is, <laughs> that is the true story, and it is definitely not the story that anyone else should attempt because it's basically impossible. This, but yeah, that's what happened. I I got a record deal. I started playing in an off. I started playing in Blue Man Group as in an off Broadway show. I started touring like in the same week. So it was an interesting time to be twenty two. Well, this is really this really is absolutely a Hollywood story, and it should it be is. It should be put into a documentary at that point, too, for sure. So when did when did Dave Grohl hear about you? And, and he invited you to appear and play guitar on a track. Well, how'd that come about? So they're really, really serious music people. Oh. All the Foo Fighters and their extended, you know, group of of bandmates and and and, you know, crew and everything. And they like found me online it was you know something that i had done or some show that i'd been on and it was you know it was also like youtube was newish so people were like whoa let's just be on youtube all the time so he he found me and then he kind of teased me not tease me on, on purpose but he was like we gotta be in we gotta make a band together and i'm like why why is dave cool writing this to me so as it turns out these okay this, these miners again this is a hollywood story but it's real <laughs> the miners in Australia and Tasmania had gotten trapped in a mine and they had gotten able, they were able to communicate with them. And they said, you know, well, they, could, they couldn't get them out, but they could send down water and stuff. And they said, okay, what else do you need? And they said, well, we want records with, we want, we want iPods with Foo Fighters records on them. So Dave Grohl thinks this is the honor of a lifetime because, you know, these guys could die and they want to listen to his music. So he promises them drunk at a bar one night that he will put a track on this new record that he's making so so what this is what he told me and then he's like oh god so now i'm sober and now i have i'm making this record so now i have to make this track so i come out to la and i go over to his you know studio and i listen to some of the record and it's sounding really cool and then he's like well, I want to play you this song. I'm like, okay, you know, waiting for them to, the, you know, the, the engineer to bring it up on the speakers. He's like, no, no, I have to play it for you. So he picks up a guitar and starts playing me this song. He's like, I don't know, like, we just got to, how do we finish this? And I was like, okay, well, I'll pick up a guitar. And we just wrote the song together. Mm -hmm. So I played, I harmonized with what he was doing. We played it on the, on the record. And then came the tour in Australia, where the miners are from. So he had to have me come out and open the, you know, I mean, when you're opening for anyone on arena tour, you're like a ant in the world. I mean, it's just, you're, you're, you're one little tiny figurine in a giant circus. <laughs> um, but at the peak, sort of at the peak of the show, he would tell the story and he'd bring me out and I would play with him to all these people, thousands of people, it was crazy. How, how, as you're doing this, how do you put this in perspective? I mean, this is really living the dream. I mean, every musician that watches this, listens to this, and is just kind of holding their head saying, this is truly following your spirit of passion. And that intent opens up doors that these great things happen. You know, that is the only count on which you and I may disagree. I really, really believe that my plan for myself is terrible. That my plan is like, I'll play in the subway forever. That, you know, my plan is a bad plan. I'm like, oh, maybe I'll 
sell, you know, four records. Like I have terrible ideas that if I just stop having ideas and just do music, the music has a better plan for me. And so I have let the, I, and I get what you're saying, but when I think about my passion, it's not for playing with Dave Grohl in Australia because who can ever predict that? My, play, my plan is just to play guitar well. That's what I want. So if I, if I had make any kind of strategic uh, career move, it's always been a disaster. And I just let, I just let go. I just think, hey, you know, as long as I play guitar well and try my best, then things happen. So I'm just going to keep doing that. Interesting. When I speak about intent, <laughs> what intent, intent usually has nothing to do with the fame and success of, for example, playing with Dave Grohl. What intent is, is that your passion to play music is so important. It doesn't matter what happens. What matters is that you're able to play your music. Well, what that the, I totally appreciate and get behind. What we, and so, and the door that opens up with intent, I mean, as I interview all these musicians, the door that opens up with intent is that their intent is so strong that opportunity arises that they could have never planned on before because the sincerity and the, the, the dedication to that passion is so strong. That's what I sense from yourself. You're, you're into what you're doing. You don't care if it's on a subway and you don't care if it's on a stage. None of that impresses you. What impresses you is as long as you're able to tell your story through your music. That's powerful. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's powerful. So let me ask you this now, a business side. You know, many of these young musicians that watch this, they look at that and they see your success and they're just, you know, blown away by it. How do you organize the business side? Do you you manage yourself? Do you handle, you know, you know, organization as far as copywriting and publishing and so right now I am managing myself and that is a COVID era decision. I have had two managers in my entire life, yeah. um, both of them very long-term and both of them very, very capable. And I plan on having one after this, this time of uh, <laughs> this, this, this year, this uh, pandemic is over um, simply because I know what I'm good at and it's not that, you know, I'm not, great at organizing details that have everything to do with me and my face and my name. Um, I'm much better at, you know, distancing myself from myself. So I think that having, you know, any kind of help that, that, that gets you sort of out of having to deal with yourself, at least for me, was very, very, really, really helpful um, and freed up a lot of time. I could look at the big picture and not all the sort of daily stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So managing copywriting, for example, like publishing, do you have your own? I have a public, I have a publishing company that I work with, which um, they're called their Domino. That's a very big international company. You know, that's been very a fruitful relationship for many years now and they've picked up many options. And so that, um, you know, somehow I keep writing songs and they, people keep listening or buying and that, you know, seems to work out. Okay. I mean, it's, you know, it's interesting because people talk about streaming and how little you get paid. And that is really true, except when you've written, you know, I've written 10 albums worth of material and I'm the sole writer on almost all of them. So even though it's still, it's still a trickle, it's still not a lot. Um, it does add up to, you know, enough money that it's kind of sort of just, you know, is income. So that's really, really helpful to, to write as much as you can and to retain the rights to that. Well, this is, and that's a very powerful message for everyone to listen to. But the fact that you've got to be prolific and you've got to write, you've got to write, yeah. write, write, write. And in time, that cumulative will add up and allow you to support yourself as a musician. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, being a writer and, and frankly, you know, even just putting into deals, you know, reversion rights that you get the rights back in, in 10 years, 20 years, 25, you know, it may seem forever. But, you know, for me, I'm starting to. I own a substantial amount of my recorded material now that was once on a record label. And that's incredibly helpful too. And it means I can do whatever I want with it. I can license it to whatever, you know, whoever I want and keep their, you know, the rights to that. So I think that that, you know, it's really easy to want to, you know, make the thing happen in the moment. Um, but it's not, you know, like think about where, you know, if you might, you might want to own your things 20 years later um, and you should try to get those rights if, if you can. Talk about scoring. You know, when you got involved with scoring some 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 movies and things, how how'd that all come about? Scoring is an interest. You know, all the scoring work I've done has been 
sort of either like massive scale projects or mi really small things that kind of pop up. And, you know, I've done my fair share of little commercials and, and, you know, tiny little bits of pieces for like, you know, a tea commercial in Japan. And, and, you know, I'll, I'll say this, I think it's really, really the most difficult industry to break into the, the most difficult part. It's hard to get up on stage and perform and to, pull an audience in, but everyone has a home studio and can take their time and perfect what they do. And I think the dream, right, is to sit and to make music for really awesome movies and television all day long. But like the truth is there aren't that many awesome movies. There aren't, isn't that, I mean, television's amazing right now, but like it's a, it's a very, very, very competitive place to be. So I have, again, kind of not, I never planned on scoring movies or being nominated for a Golden Globe. And yet here I am. Um, I think just the, the, t the fact that the music itself that I make is often very cinematic, it's instrumental, it has a lot of, you know, touchy feely stuff that happens, people want to have their, you know, have it in their score. That is what has led me um, into just, you know, a couple of really cool projects. Well, that's so great. But you, you, I see you as a very, very creative person. Talk about the, the Picasso guitar paintings and what you did with that at the Museum of Modern Art. They had they had a exhibition of, of Picasso's guitars, you know, and he painted and sculpted and put together so many different um, guitars, um, being Spanish. And so I did. I just did a small performance as part of that exhibition. But during that time, I was play, I had this crazy collection. I, mean, I still have a crazy collection, but at the time I was I was bringing the collection on stage. And it was, you know, a harp guitar and a banjo resonator guitar and, and Weissenborn. And, you know, it was sort of guitar related and related instruments. So I was I was really um, exploring non-traditional fretted fretted um, things at that point. Um, things that were just guitar adjacent. Um, like, you know, tiny high strung 12 string guitar that I have, you know, so I was writing songs on all of these things and then playing them live, but having all of them surrounding me on stage. That's extremely creative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you <laughs> talked to my guitar tech about how she felt about that one. <laughs> and to tune like 100 strings every night. <laughs> Let me ask you this question. Did you, um, did you have any mentors that guided you along the way? I, I didn't have any mentors and I have sort of understood why, because they're just like, they're, it was just those sort of very incredibly tiny group of people that were, were doing what I did for whatever reason, I didn't end up with a mentor and I really wish that had happened. Mm -hmm. And I try to do my best to reach out my hand now and, you know, especially to women guitar players who just don't see themselves often enough. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it can be anything from just like, you know, I have a WhatsApp group of, you know, female guitar players that we just chat about things that are happening. You know, they're like professional, semi-professional. And then I have, you know, I, I try to give something back that I, that I, that I really knew I could have used because I had a lot of, you know, I had a lot of confusion, a lot of questions. Um, I had a drive, but I didn't have a lot of, you know, again, like I, I didn't know exactly where it was going. Um, but I do think that it can be just as valuable to mentor as to have, you know, have a mentor. Um, it's been incredibly valuable to see people who are, who are amazing, great, great players, great writers, very young, sort of like popping their head up and going, I don't know what's happening. Do you know what's happening? And I'm like, I don't know what's happening, but we can talk about it. <laughs> What motivates you? I think it's the guitar that motivates me. I think the guitar is fascinating to me, and it is an infinite, and it call it's like it's like calling to be explored and to be messed with and deconstructed and and misunderstood and reunderstood. I mean, it's it's just very it's a compelling instrument. It's very satisfying. It goes everywhere. It's not it's not expensive. You can be barely okay and make great music. You can be brilliant and, you know, really kind of make unlistenable sound. I mean, you can, you can do anything on it. So I think that that's the big motivation is just, there's just more, there's just more, there's more places to go. 
there's more to write, just many, many paths in the instrument. This pandemic has been challenging for musicians at many levels with the lack of touring, with the challenges of being home. How have you been able to adapt to it? What, what, what have you done during this time that maybe could be assisting you to move forward with what you do? <laughs> I got nothing. <laughs> I got I got a whole bunch of, I have a lot. I, I, I take depression naps. Those are great. I, the lesson of the pandemic and the goal of the pandemic is to get through the pandemic. There is nothing really to me. No, I've done some things and I was able to release an album. I mean, there's, there's, there's always stuff, but I have not made it a goal to do anything that didn't feel natural, I guess. And what feels natural is focusing on family, trying to stay sane. And yeah, I play guitar. I play guitar every day, but I don't have a, you know, I'm not writing the, I'm not writing my opus. I'm not, forcing myself to do something that doesn't feel right. And it did not, it went, you know, and I, and I have a lot of respect for people who like made amazing, you know, pivots and were able to go online and have their career work from there. It's been really inspiring. I just felt it was, it was sort of gauche and and rushed and um, not something that I wanted to do because I, I'm not touring, not because I just, don't want to tour. I'm not touring because people are dying. And it feels like I don't need to make this about me or my career right now. I just, you know, it was crazy enough putting out an album, but you know, I'm also talking from with the experience of I've been playing guitar for like 36 years. It's not going to go away in a week, you know, it's not going to go away a year. And, and so I think that I really wish I had more inspiring words on that end but I just, you know, I have to kind of help myself here. And I really have to focus on like, really, the lesson of this is just to get through this. There's, you know, for me, there's nothing bigger than, you know, existing through this time and, and not dying and not having friends and family die, which have happened. That's, what, that's all I got. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, not, it's not cool. It's not optimistic. Um, well, but it's, it's me. It's, it's unfortunately, it is reality right now. And that's the challenge that everyone's going through, how to deal with this and how to face this. We have many young musicians and many, you know, dedicated musicians that listen to this channel. And what's amazing about it is they are looking for a path for themselves to find their direction right. and pursue their passion and what their love is. In closing, Kaki, what would you say to this generation that's listening of what they can do to, to maybe follow their passion or trust their instinct or face risk? What would you say to them? Well, I think, you know, we touched on it a little earlier, but the sense that something isn't good enough, um, which can be really heightened by the pressure of social media, because there are some, there are so many amazing guitar players, amazing musicians on Instagram right now. It's, it's, it's incredible. And it's intimidating. It's intimidating to me. And, and I'm like, wait a minute, I, I, I wrote this. Um, but I think being able to, to let go is really helpful being able to just like, re you know, release a thing, whether it is, if it's a, you know, you playing guitar for 10 minutes, if it's you, you know, like your magnum opus, but just once it's gone, let it go and let, let it be, you know, there's so many ways that things find their way into people's ears and people recommend things and tag other people, you know, it's just, it's such a, it's almost so much easier now to just say, okay, like I give you my blessing and now, you know, <laughs> hit post and then move on. Compare, compare is despair, right? Compare and despair. So really try to keep away from looking at someone that is maybe your age or your sex or your same hair color, whatever. And they're like, oh, they're better. Well, that's not true. That's a lie you're telling yourself. But it's a, it's a lifelong lesson of getting out of your own way. And I think a lot of that is, is honed sometimes in private and sometimes, you know, really like the strength of just being able to play guitar or play whatever it is on your own for many, many hours is there's a lot of strength there that'll carry you through other, you know, into other places, but just keep going. That's it. Just keep going. Well, I like that, that message of perseverance, which you seem to do very well. And I like the line, everyone glows, Everybody glows. They really mm -hmm. do. There's something that is there that that shines a light that they can find. And even in the darkest times, 
we become that light and we become that glowing force sometimes just for ourselves Mm -hmm. You seem to do that really well. You seem to have this light that just keeps on going. You have this perseverance and this dedication. You have this courage of just going someplace where you're not exactly sure where you're going, but you just put your head down and you seem to go there really well. Well, the more times, you know, like you realize you're going to survive being uncomfortable. You know, I'm going to survive not knowing what I'm doing. I've survived it. It's not going to kill me. It's not going to end my career. It's really like I've, I've just been, been, I've, these are all things that are, that are hard won. Um, but if I could, you know, let people know that like, no, like I have really, truly, I have done it for you. If you need to borrow all of my various humiliations along the way, please do. <laughs> I've also put out terrible music. I have done things that I infinitely regret as a musician because I just didn't know, you know, it was just happening to me. So, um, but there's not like nothing is going to kill you. It's just not, it's not going to kill you. It's not going to kill your career because there's always the next thing. People have no memory anymore. Everything is gone in a second. Um, and so I think that really like it, it's just don't ever be worried or embarrassed or um, ashamed or shocked or anything, you know, just like it, it's all eventually going to look like one beautiful, funny lesson. It's going to always, everything's going to make a good story. That's the other thing. No one loves a story of an underdog more than ever the world, you know? <laughs> so dye your hair and wear the clothes you want and feel the feelings you want and do, the, do your thing. It's going to be fine. Well, if anybody has got a great story, you have got that. And we've no, had that. Yeah, my, my story. <laughs> don't, don't do, don't do my story though, because my story doesn't happen. <laughs> well, it has proven to be a very very good story with all the challenges that you had artist series at a distance we welcome you we thank you so much khaki it's been great to have you here thank you i hope to do this one day in person <laughs> thank you so much thank you so much stay well and stay safe Dom Famular here, the Sessions panel. This is so exciting. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Click the subscribe button to be a part of what we're doing. The views help us tremendously. All of your comments, we read them and react to them. This is incredible. The support you're giving us is great. The Sessions panel, we'll see you real soon.